Hi, welcome back to Post-it number 11. Today joining us is Callie, who is making it very interesting to read aloud. Uh, when we left off with Post-it 10, we were um, hearing about the gauntlet and about how this poor guy whose name is, let's see, I'm looking back and seeing if I can find it, Evan Smalls, has been what we can assume dared to do the gauntlet. And they were trying to fill in rows about it so that they could fill her in. Bench dropped his force on the plate, fork on the plate and said, well, I'm going to the gauntlet. He declared. He turned to me. You'll be there, won't you? Suddenly I was on the spot. I squirmed in my seat, sensing, sensing Bench boring holes into me on one side. And Wolf's sharp green eyes on me from the other. A simple enough question, except it wasn't simple at all. Bench was challenging me, and somehow I couldn't back down, not in front of everyone and not in front of Rose. What, pass up a chance for someone to plow into a tree at 40 miles an hour and possibly crack their skull open? Who wouldn't want to see that? I said half-heartedly. I didn't return Wolf's stare or bother to look at Dee Dee either. I did glance over at Rose just, just to see if I could tell what she was thinking, but there was no reading her expression. I didn't know one thing, though. When Bench punched me playfully on the shoulder after I agreed to go with him to watch Evan Smalls try to kill himself, it actually hurt a little. Bench picked up his tray and said that he was finished and that he needed to go get something from his locker before next period. We'll meet up after school, all right? He was speaking to me, only to me. I gave the most imperceptible of nods. As he walked away, Wolf waved to him, but Bench's hands were so full he didn't wave back. The next chapter is called The Gauntlet. Middle school is a minefield, deciding who to like and not to like, who to follow and who to ignore completely, worrying you're going to trip while walking down the hall and sprawling all over the floor like a beach starfish, wondering if you should raise your hand when the teacher asks a hard question and risk exposing your nerdiness for the sake of a few bonus points, taking every sideways glance as a message and trying to track the, crack the code. Every day you're bound to do something that gets you noticed by the wrong people. Every day you're bound to step somewhere you shouldn't. I know all about those minefields. Honest to God, explosive burn-in-the-dirt minefields from my crazy Uncle Mike, the one who gave me the whale shirt for my birthday. He actually served in the Army straight out of high school and did two tours on a bomb squad. His official title, I guess, was Explosive Ordnance Disposal Specialist, but his buddies gave him the nickname Pinky. He spent most of his time in Iraq, for round two as he called it, helping to detonate and disarm landmines and IEDs, which are improvised explosive devices. Like a toilet paper tube full of gunpowder, only more complex and a lot more dangerous. It was an IED that gave my uncle his nickname because he actually blew off three of his own figures, but the surgeons managed to reattach two of them. Sometimes things stick, sometimes they don't. Uncle Mike told me all about it in incredibly gory detail. I could sit and listen to my uncle's war stories for hours, partly because they expanded my vocabulary. He only censored his language when mom was around but also because they kind of put things in perspective. My uncle had seen bombs capable of leveling buildings and taking out a whole city block, though he says nothing compared to the time that he had to babysit me as an infant and I blew out my diaper. He actually then called me a biological WMD, a weapon of mass destruction because of that diaper, and told me that that one diaper was the reason he never got married and had kids of his own. Though I suspect maybe there were other reasons. He had seen things I'd never seen, and I hoped I'd never have to see. He said he didn't have a whole lot of patience for people who didn't know a good thing when they had it. Sometimes I wonder if that didn't mean my parents. Uncle Mike used to come visit a few times a year before my dad moved away. And when he did, he'd tell me about all the things that he had seen blow up. The last time I saw him was four years ago. Mom and Dad hadn't spoken to each other in a while, and I swear it was so cold in the house you could actually see icicles hanging from the windows in June. On the second day of the long weekend... Uncle Mike came outside to finish his beer and found me bouncing a tennis ball off the garage. I know what you're doing, he said with a sly grin, stepping off the porch and coming towards me. He wore long sleeves even in the summer. He said he got accustomed to having every square inch covered. I'm playing catch, I told him. I was only nine at the time, and I hadn't even met, met Bench yet. I had sort of friends, but no tribe, and I was used to spending time by myself. I lobbed the tennis ball against the garage door again, but my uncle was faster than me and snatched it before I could. He held the radio thing up between his forefingered hand. You're staying out of the way, he said. I didn't know what to say, so instead I took the ball from him and started chucking it again. In some ways, Uncle Mike is the exact opposite of my father. He didn't care for books. He liked big crowds and loud gatherings. He was a people person, which said he, which said he was unusual for someone to spend most of his time working by himself, trying not to get blown up. 
He actually tried to get along with my mother, made a really good effort, which was another big difference between him and dad. But there was one thing that he and dad had in common. Neither one of them was afraid to lecture me about life, whether I wanted them to or not. I took it better coming from Uncle Mike. It didn't sound like a lecture. It sounded like two guys talking. Besides, he was immensely cool in a, yeah, I got my figure blown off in combat kind of way. It's all right. I get it, he said, standing beside me, taking a sip from his can. It's the safest thing. You walk down a road and you see a wire poking out of the dirt, so you stop walking and you back up and call EOD. Uncle Mike liked to use acronyms. He was full of them, and I suspected he was full of a lot of things. Nobody could have that many true stories. You take clever and cross your fingers, but you stay out of the way. And sometimes there's no RSP. RSP, I said. Render safe procedures. Whatever you got to do, you make sure that it doesn't get somebody hurt. You know, don't cut the black wire or whatever crap they teach you in the movies. But sometimes there's really not much you can do. Nothing but trigger the thing and stay out of the way. You know what I'm saying, right? I wasn't sure. This is coming from a guy with nine fingers, I said, tossing the ball again. Thunk, bounce, catch. Thunk, bounce, catch, the ball went. I said, try, he said, intercepting my ball. You don't always get out in one piece. He bounced it as hard as he could against the pavement with his pinkyless hand. A fly ball for me to catch, but unfortunately the sun temporarily blinded me. I lost track of it, and it bounced down the driveway and into the street. My uncle and I watched it, sort of daring one another to go after it. In the end, we just left it there, resting by the curb and sat together on the porch, him nursing his beer and me chucking a Coke, both of us listening to the nothing coming from inside the house and me wondering what kind of man decides to detonate bombs for a living. My uncle may be wondering the same thing. But some things I guess you can't shy away from. Some things you have to tackle head on, whether it's safe or not, even if it means losing a part of you. So Evan Smalls was running the gauntlet at four which meant I needed to get home and grab my bike if I wanted to make it out to Hirohito, Hirohito Hill in time to meet Bench. That's what everybody called the gauntlet when nobody was careening down it. Hirohito Hill. At least that's what the kids called it long before us, and it stuck. I'm not even sure that hill actually has a real name, and I don't know who owns the land. The town, I guess? Or maybe it's just been in somebody's family for generations and they've forgotten about it. There are no signs saying keep out, although there probably should be. Not that that would stop us. There's not much that would stop a 13-year-old boy from trying to kill himself in an attempt to prove how cool they are. Maybe barbed wire. Maybe high voltage. I don't know. Probably not. The rules would just be different. Legend says that the hill was named after the Emperor of Japan during World War II. The same emperor who encouraged his pilots to nosedive into battleships and aircraft carriers. They could have called it Kamikaze Hill, I guess, but then you wouldn't have the alliteration. I'm sort of a sucker for alliteration. You think it would be the kind of thing you grow out of, an idea that you packed up after elementary school along with your glue sticks and your Yu-Gi-Oh cards, but not in Branton. In Branton, the gauntlet is an institution, an integral part of our life as Mr. Twisty's, Stockbridge Statue, Fredo's Greasy Pizza Parlor, or Mustache Mick, the homeless guy who begs for loose change outside of Andy's Bar on 10th Street, and has a big black broom, broomstick uh, curtaining his mouth. Every kid in Branton had given Mick at least a dollar and shelled out two fifty for a jumbo slice of pizza at Fredo's, and everybody had seen at least one kid try to tackle the gauntlet. It was our proving grounds, our octagon, our hunger games. A giant tree-studded hill, overgrown and wild with brush and ivy. There was no easy path down. The slope, Dee Dee once calculated, was at least 50 degrees, and I know better than to question his math. It took you three minutes to walk your bike up it. You could make it back down in 20 seconds, providing nothing stopped you. But something always stopped you. There was no single straight line path. To navigate it, you had to turn. And turning on that kind of slope, going that kind of speed, was tricky to do once, let alone the dozen times you would need to do it in order to dodge the trees and reach the bottom in one piece. I had never ridden the gauntlet, but I'd run down it on foot a few times. That was slightly safer. When you feel like you're going too fast, you could just whip out an arm and lasso one of the thousand trees that threaten to pulverize you and anchor yourself to it. But even running down it, you, you run the risk of tripping over a root or getting tangled in the underbrush or splitting your head open on a rock or twisting your ankle on a bike. You're pretty much better off just closing your eyes and hoping that the angels guide you. In the whole history of Branton Middle School, more than 50 years, there were probably only a dozen kids who ever made it to the bottom in one piece. All of them had long since graduated. Their names were recorded in whispers, passed down from kid generation to kid generation. 
and none of them were named Evan Smalls. He was going to crash, no doubt about it, and that's why everyone was here. They wanted to watch. I met Bench at the base, standing in the field of clover, clover and spent dandelions, where everybody just pitched their bikes in a great big pile. I was early. I mean, Evan hadn't even shown up yet. But there was already a crowd. Lots of people I knew, but Bench was the only one I was friends with. Beat ya, he said when he saw me. I guess they didn't change their minds. Wolf and Dee Dee, he meant. Maybe Bench thought that they would call last minute and say they were coming. But Wolf was probably rocking some Chopin, and Dee Dee was probably locked in his room, polishing his dice and drawing out maps for our Saturday night session. I did not tell Bench how close I was to not coming myself. How awkward I felt with both him and Wolf staring at me at the table. He seemed to know what I was thinking, though. He said, man, lunch today. Yeah, I said. Weird. So weird, I said. Not sure if we were using the same word the same way. It had certainly been uncomfortable. But then the origami thing had been kind of funny. Komodo dragon, I mumbled. Yeah, what was up with that anyway? If I would have known, I would have just told her to make a fish. Bench grunted. Something tells me Rose Holland is going to do whatever she wants to do, no matter what you say. Those words mashed together seemed to be a form of a compliment, but it didn't really come off that way. And her and Wolf? He didn't even ask. I mean, that's our table. I didn't tell him that Wolf had asked me, sort of. I mean, he just didn't ask Bench. Maybe that's what the, because he knew what the answer would be. It's just lunch, I said, sensing the tension in Bench's voice. Suddenly, I wasn't sure I really wanted to talk about this anymore. Yeah, I know, Bench said, but did you see the looks we were getting? And not just today, yesterday, too. Some of the guys I practiced with, you could tell what they were thinking. I tried not to think about what they were thinking. I told myself I didn't care. I didn't have guys who practiced with me, but I had Bench, and obviously Bench cared. It's kind of hard to blame them, he continued. I mean, she's kind of, well, you know... She is what? The unfinished sentence hung between us as we started up the hill. It was sort of daring me to look in the blank. I mean, Rose is odd, I guess. I mean, she doesn't dress like most of the other girls at school. She doesn't act the same way. I mean, in two days, I hadn't seen her in the hallway with anyone except for Wolf or one of the teachers. She was new, an outsider, someone who had never even heard of this hill we were currently walking up or seen anybody ride down the other side. She obviously stuck out. It's not just how she looks, Bench added quickly. Seeming to read my thoughts again, I heard her mom's crazy, and no one's even seen her dad. Well, you sure know a lot about her, I said, maybe more suggestive than I meant to. Bench stopped and gave me a hard stare. We were nearly at the top of the hill now, where everyone else had gathered, clustered in their own tribes. People say things, Frost, you know that. Yeah, I knew that. Sometimes the things they say get back around to you, and sometimes they don't. But either way, you know they're out there. We're going to stop there. See you next time.